Christopher Modi, I'm Director of Clinical Affairs for Heidelberg Engineering. My role within the company is predominantly medical education and training. Hello, I'm Richard Gale. I'm a consultant medical ophthalmologist and I work in York in the UK. I practice in the field of inflammatory eye disease and medical disorders of the retina. Integral to managing these patients are understanding of imaging technologies and OCTA is of particular importance at the moment. This is a short instructional video looking at a systematic approach to evaluating OCTA images. It's directed at clinicians and technicians who are working with this technology. Although OCT angiography gives very nice images, it's important to understand that it's giving limited information about flow in the vasculature. It's important to interpret this with other imaging modalities to gain additional information. Colour photography would be particularly useful for signs such as exudate, and this may give an indication of the chronicity of a disease process. This information would not be gained from OCTA. Blue Peak Autofluorescence is also complementary and may give information about atrophy or pseudoreticular drusen. Conventional dye-based angiography is particularly useful to give information about the blood retinal barrier. Breakdown of the blood retinal barrier is identified on fluorescein angiography through leakage, but OCTA does not identify leakage. It's important that the small field of view captured with OCTA may miss key clinical characteristics and to help with the diagnosis. An example of this would be peripheral neovascularization due to diabetic retinopathy. Analyzing structural OCT and a retinal map would be important in identifying thickness. Thickness is not information that would be gained from OCTA. Structural images may provide surrogate information about breakdown of a blood retinal barrier or atrophy. Before reviewing and analysing OCTA images, the images should be checked for quality. In the same way that we would review conventional OCT, fundus images or angiographic images for artefact, we need to do the same with OCTA images. We should be identifying is there any evidence of media opacity, large refractive error which may cause distortion of the images, is there evidence of truncation or shadowing, may be caused by vitreous floaters or again media opacity. When reviewing the OCTA image we should look at the fundus reflectance image to identify is there any cause for poor quality data, assess the B-scan image for accuracy of segmentation, and review the ONFAS OCTA images or transverse section OCTA images to ensure that we're seeing accurate segmentation of the superficial vascular plexus, deep vascular complex and avascular complex. Segmentation errors occur frequently within OCTA scans and these must be corrected prior to reviewing the images. If we look at this example of a patient with a fibrovascular PED, we can see that the Brooks membrane position on the automatic segmentation has been incorrectly defined. This needs to be corrected if we're going to see proper visualization of the choroidal nevascularization. The segmentation editing package is opened, the Brooks membrane position is identified, and the node points are edited and corrected for the appropriate position for Brooks membrane. This process will need to be completed for five to seven B scans across the whole volume scan. The information and corrected segmentation position will then be propagated, providing accurate visualization of the Brooks membrane position and the true extent of the choroidal nevascularization. The corrected segmentation position can now be visualized and the larger extent of the choroidal nevascularization can now be seen. When viewing OCTA scans for the first time, it's important to remember that the superficial vascular complex position only provides limited information. Using the retina and the full retinal segmentation provides 
information at deeper locations as well as more superficial locations and therefore we will be able to identify the presence of choroidal nevascularization or nevascularization elsewhere more easily within the OCTA scan. In this example of a patient with neovascularization elsewhere, the superficial vascular complex position does not completely identify the extent of the neovascularization elsewhere. Using the retina and the full uh, segmentation positions allows us to appreciate the neovascularization elsewhere more clearly. Once the full image of the OCTA has been reviewed and abnormality may be identified, it's now important to try and identify where this is within the retina. This can be done using the predefined segmentations. The superficial vascular complex can be viewed first, following that the deep vascular complex can be viewed. Following this, we work our way through the retina into the intermediate capillary plexus, then the deep capillary plexus to look for the foveal avascular zone, the avascular complex, furthermore the choriocapillaris, and then the choroid. Here we see an example of a branch retinal vein occlusion analyzed using the predefined segmentation. We've seen the superior vascular complex and then the deep vascular complex. The deep vascular complex and the intermediate capillary plexus are useful in analysing the arcades. Furthermore, we look at the deep capillary plexus, then the avascular complex, choriocapillaris, and then choroid. The slider tools use adaptive segmentation. The scan profile changes from the ILM position through to the Brooks membrane position. In patients with pathological change, the retinal architecture is often disrupted, causing an inaccurate segmentation of the OCTA image. Using the slider tool, this dynamic approach allows the appreciation and visualization of pathology more accurately than using the conventional predefined segmentation. The slider tools need to be set up using the reference position ILM to Brooks membrane, setting a thickness slab of either 60 or 40 microns, and ensuring that the projection artifact removal software and the automatic contrast are engaged. The slider tool in the bottom left of the window is moved up and down. This moves the segmentation slab up and down through the B-scan, allowing us to visualize different on presentations at different locations. Using the slider tool is particularly helpful if the segmentation is suboptimal. It also helps visualize the retina in a three-dimensional way. Within the custom slab section, two slider tools have been created a 60 micron thickness slab and a 40 micron thickness slab. 60 microns provides better visualization of choroidal nevascularization and provides a little more depth penetration beneath the RPE into the superficial choroid. The slider 40 or 40 micron thickness slab is preferable for visualizing retinal vascular disease and intraretinal changes. This is a practical example of using the slider tool. As the segment is moved down through the retina, we can see in this example of retinal angiometrous proliferation, the rat lesion is initially seen. As it's moved down further, we see the chorioretinal anastomosis. And then later on the pigment epithelial detachment. It's important to also analyze the on-fast image as further information is gained from visualizing the exudate and therefore the nature of the process.
The OCT and Geography window provides four images. A transverse section OCTA image, a transverse section or ONFAS structural image, an orthogonal or vertically oriented B-scan image, and a structural B-scan or horizontally oriented image. In the example of a patient with choroidal nevascularization, we can see the CNV in the transverse section OCTA, the transverse section OCT, the orthogonal and sagittal B scans. By clicking on the transverse section image, we're able to identify areas of hyperreflectivity and correlate these to areas of subretinal fluid visualized within the B scan images and areas of intraretinal fluid and the cystic changes that we can visualize again on the B-scan images. This is an example of how co-localization works in neovascular AMD. The top right image shows the OCTA flow and this bottom right image shows that the flow is anterior to the RPE. We next move to the lower left area of increased flow in the OCT angiogram and we can see bottom right that the flow is beneath the RPE. Having identified where the areas of increased flow are, we're now going to use co-localization to identify areas of subretinal fluid. The abnormalities within the top left on fast image enable us to localize the subretinal fluid in the bottom right image. Having identified the areas of increased flow, we're now going to use co-localization to identify areas of subretinal fluid. This is important as it may identify areas of recent activity. The top left image on FAST shows abnormality, which is co-localized bottom right to the subretinal fluid. An additional useful display modality is the B-scan view. This allows you to fly through the volume scan comparing the location of flow information and the correlating structural changes. The speed of the replay of the video can be adjusted and the structure and flow information isolated. In this exported video presentation, we can see the fundus reflectance image with the moving B-scan position, the structural B-scan, the structure with the overlaid flow, and the isolated flow information within three separate panes. In this example, we can see structural OCT plus flow we try to identify non-physiological flow. Of course, we can see physiological flow within the choroid and retina. In this particular example, there is a serious PED. It would be important to try and identify whether this is driven by neovascularization. As we run through the images, we see no abnormal flow at the edges of the pigment epithelial detachment. In this example, we see a pigment epithelial detachment. However, we see abnormal flow associated with this. This may be indicative of choroidal neovascularization. So to address the question of whether we still need other imaging modalities when we have OCTA, we need to appreciate that we're still on a quite a steep learning curve of the value of OCTA. Uh, in my opinion, it needs to be put into the context of the clinical history and the value of what we can get with the flow data with OCTA. We may well still need color imaging, autofluorescence. We may still need dye-based angiography, particularly if the OCTA does not give us the answer that we we're initially anticipating. 
So in summary, we need to develop a logical manner of how to interpret OCT angiography scans. Of course, we need to ensure that this is the correct patient and the correct eye. We need to check the quality of the image, looking for media opacities, looking for segmentation errors or projection artifacts. Looking at the scan itself, it's important to look at the overall flow within the image. The predefined segments are then uh, useful. The superficial vascular plexus followed by the deep vascular plexus can be used. We then look at the capillary images and the choroidal images. If the predefined segmentation is not sufficient, then the slider tools are very useful. Once these have been looked at, we can co-localize where the area of interest is using the crosshairs. Once a slider tool utility has been used, it would be important to look at co-localization of the region of interest and really hone in on where we need to pay our particular attention. It's important not to forget to look at flow within the B-scan as well. A lot of data is captured in the OCTA images. It's important to appreciate this fully and use the data. So this isn't a quick process. It takes time to evaluate systematically all the images. And of course, we need to learn to evaluate these two-dimensional images in a three-dimensional way.